Hello, my, my name is Professor Joyce Harper and I work at University College London in the Institute for Women's Health. And it's National Science Week today and I've been asked to come to Suffolk Walden County High School to talk about how a woman succeeds in a man's world. And when I first got asked to give this talk, I felt, really, is that a title we should be discussing in 2015? But then I thought about it more and I've talked to loads of people and I realised, well, yes, it is actually. And even Hillary Clinton agrees that this is a subject that we should be talking about. So what I'm going to talk to today about is why am I giving this talk, the history of women's education and work um, in the UK, and then looking at the worldwide situation, and then the future, where can we go from here? So some statistics first. So across Europe, looking at 22 to 24 year olds gaining at least an upper secondary education, 82% are women and 77% are men. And in the US, 57% of college graduates and 63% of master's students are women. So gen we can see generally, academically, women outperform men. So we're getting the education in the West, but how is that being translated into the workplace? Well, we can look at some statistics here. 21 of the Fortune 500 CEOs are women, 14% of executive officers, 16% of board seats, 22% of MPs, and at University College London, where I work and I'm a professor, only 21 professors are women. So we can see that even though we're getting educated, we're not in the leadership roles, we're not in these top jobs at the moment. If we look at some data from 2013, from 17,000 UK graduates that went to the same university and did the same study, men get paid more. 30% of women and 44% of men were earning over 24,000. So we're not even not getting the top jobs. Even when we're starting at the beginning of our careers, we've got an imbalance of our wages. And if we look at the, some of the books that are out there to try and help women rectify the situation, there's really a huge number of books. These are just a few of them. But interestingly, there's not one similar book for men. So how did we get in this situation? Why in 2015 do we have this inequality between men and women in the workplace? Well, traditionally, the role of a woman is as a mother. She has to carry the baby and she has to nurture the baby and then also look after the family. So women historically have rarely worked. The mother's role has been a homemaker, providing um, food and looking after the children. And if we start really far back, look at Jesus. Jesus' disciples were all male. The women had a, a very different role in the story of Jesus than uh, the men. Muhammad instructed men to treat your women well. And if we look at world leaders and if we look at monarchy worldwide, we will see that in the majority of situations, world leaders and the monarchy are men. So even in 2015, it's still quite rare to have a woman in these leadership roles. Some of the problems have arisen from inheritance and dowries, and this has led to some sex selection in this situation. So we've got this, uh, this um, term called primogeniture, which is the firstborn male inherits everything. So this includes estates, titles, and also in the monarchy. In the majority of countries, things would be handed down through the male line. Look at Henry VIII. He's a classic example for those watching Wolf Hall at the moment. You will see that uh, we all know that he um, divorced and beheaded several of his wives trying to get a male heir to the throne. And one of the problems is dowries. Uh, this is the money or property given to a husband on marriage. So if a couple deliver a girl, they have to look after the girl, feed the girl, maybe educate her. But at some point in many countries around the world, she is then going to cost them money as they have to provide a dowry. And when she marries, chances are she's going to leave the family and move to, with her husband's family. Whereas if they have a male, there's a celebration of males born. Because for a male, they're going to do all the same as for the girl. They're going to educate and feed and nurture the, the male child. But the male child, chances are, is then going to look after them and sustain them and help them in their later years through his employment. So as a result, in many countries of the world, we have a selection of males, either during pregnancy, before pregnancy, or even after so I'm involved in something called pre-implantation genetic diagnosis and we can use this procedure to sex the child before birth. And if we do that in, the, in Europe, it is illegal to do that because we value girls as much as boys. But in many countries, including the Middle East and other countries, there is a huge selection of male offspring. 
The male brings so much benefit to the family that people feel it's really vitally important to have a male in their family. So, for example, China's had a single child policy for many decades, and if you're only allowed to have one child, the, some of them will choose to have a male child rather than a female. So also in pregnancy, there is an ultrasound scan that can be done around 18 weeks of pregnancy and will sex the child. And in many cultures, the ultrasound scan, if it's shown to be a girl, then the couple may opt for fe uh, female feticide where they decide to terminate the pregnancy because it's not a male. Obviously, this is not ethically acceptable anywhere, but this does happen worldwide. And even after delivery, we also get infanticide of female offspring. So, so in some countries, the female children are just left and they're not looked after and these uh, infants will obviously die. So these are a few things that I just got just from briefly Googling this topic. Um, the three most deadliest words in the world, it's a girl. And in India, India kills 10 million girls in 20 years. And there's much more information about this that you can find on the web. So let's look at education and work in the UK. Well, in 1878, which really is not significantly that many that long ago, UCL was the first UK university to admit women. And so it was really expected that for most women, they were not going to be educated and not going to be expected to work. And if women were educated, they were educated in different subjects than the boys were. So there's many period dramas on at the moment. And if you watch any of them, Wolf Hall, Downton Abbey, Pole Dark, Indian Summers, you see, especially for the rich women, they were taught how to sew, how to sing, um, other types of musical accomplishments, how to draw nice pictures. So these were really accomplishments. They were expected to be taught how to be a good wife and a good woman. So we only really worked historically if you were a widow, a spinster, spinster or if you were poor. And if we look at the Victorian working classes, the women took low paid jobs. They took domestic services, textile industry, those sorts of jobs. And there was very much gender specific employment. So women took the junior roles and men took the senior roles. And here we can see some of the suffragettes trying to get votes for women. These things did change in the West during the World Wars. During World War I and World War II, the men left the country to go and fight. So these jobs, the senior jobs and the more skilled jobs had to be taken on by women. So this led to a real reform in those sorts of countries that were involved in the World Wars. And it's now 40 years since the Sex Discrimination Act. And on the end of this slide, I've got a quote from Jane Austen from Mansfield Park. Life seems but a quick succession of busy nothings. And I think for many wealthy women around the world, and even still nowadays, I think this applies to some women, um, they don't have any uh, achievement from their uh, days besides bringing up the children, which is obviously a great sense of achievement. I'm certainly not undermining that, but they're not in, uh, encouraged uh, to go into the more high powered jobs. Worldwide, education is still a huge issue. I'm sure we've all heard of Malala, who won the Nobel Peace Prize for her work trying to um, encourage girls to get educated and her fight against the Taliban. And really, many countries around the world are really far behind on the education of women. And these are just a few of the worldwide differences. Even if we educate the women, there are so many differences in the opportunities open to women in the developing world and in the developed world to work. So I've traveled to the Middle East a lot and also to Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabian women still don't have the vote. Um, it was hoped it was going to be changed this year, but unfortunately the king died and we're not sure what's going to happen there. Many, many women cannot go anywhere without a mahram, and a mahram is a uh, chaperone, so it's normally a male member of their family. They cannot drive a car, and very few of them work. So if I think of my daily life that I lead in the UK, I couldn't do hardly any of that if I lived in Saudi Arabia. I couldn't drive my car, go to the gym, have fun with my friends. I couldn't even get to work. And I've given many talks in the Middle East, um, recently I gave a talk in Iran and in Iran, um, the lecture theatre I went in, the women all sat totally separate from the men. Um, they weren't allowed to uh, touch each other or really um, conversing was even limited. So um, the lectern for where I had to give the presentation was on the men's side of the room. I was the only woman invited to this conference so I had to go and stand on the men's side. They also told me I could sit on the men's side. 
And then at the coffee break and lunch break, um, the men and women went to separate rooms, even for coffee break and lunch and dinner. So I had to go with the men. So I found it really uncomfortable to be sitting in a room with hundreds of men and be the only woman and being a very aware that all the other women were in another room. And some people will feel very uncomfortable. I felt very uncomfortable with this. And I asked the women, am I really helping? I feel that I'm doing an injustice going uh, to the room with the men. And they said, no, you're helping. At least you're one woman in that situation. So you are helping us to try and get things more equal. And a bit of a sideline to the topic of this talk, but I saw this um, poster on the tube recently and I thought I'd use it for this talk. Forced marriages and forced many other things in women around the world. And this says, at 15, I was forced to marry a man of 57. Now I worry for my daughter. We have to think about the inequalities globally. So where's the future lie? So are we going to have any improvement in this? Have we really got um, equal uh, opportunities for the sexes, even in the Western world? Well, one issue, no matter how much we educate women and much, how much career opportunities they get, Currently, women are still the people who carry the child and nurture the child, at least for the first six months or so, if they're breastfeeding. So the limitation has been our biological clock. Our biological clock really is ticking very fast when we get into our 30s. And over the age of 35, we're at real risk of becoming um, infertile. So our IVF clinics are full of women of an average age of 38. Chances are they were very fertile 10 years previously, but now they've delayed their motherhood, they're finding it very hard to get pregnant. And the rate limiting factor on our fertility as we age is the age of our egg. And only in recent years has the egg freezing technique become acceptable. And this technique can be used to freeze the eggs um, we could freeze them when we're 25 and keep them as a backup if we are then get to 38 or older and we want to try and have a family at that time. So when I first read about some of the companies such as Facebook and Apple paying for their female employees to have their eggs frozen, I did, I did feel a bit uncomfortable that this was really taking things over the line. Um, but then I looked into it more and recently I was involved in a debate at UCL during international uh, it's a series of talks we had for International Women's Day and we had a debate um, called Does Egg Freezing Enable Women to Have It All? And I spoke for this. I think it does. I think it's certainly a step in the right, right direction. It makes women more uh, attractive to employ because if you're employing a 30 year old woman at the moment chances are at some point in the next five years or so she's going to want to take maternity leave to have her family so it keeps female talents in the post gives women equal rights to men um, certainly with regards to conception and it but i must not undermine that we also need improved childcare. Childcare in the majority of countries is really suboptimal so Egg freezing is one option, but I think our number one aim should be to work on childcare and make this much more accessible so that women can have it all. We can have a career and look after our children in a safe environment and try to do everything well. But we won't become truly equal to men until men can carry a pregnancy, but we're not anywhere near that yet. And uh, that's for another maybe 10 or 20 years. Another thing that's happening in the UK is the Athena Swan Charter. We use this at University College London, and this is recognising commitment to advancing women's careers in science, technology, engineering, maths and medicine, employment in higher education and research. And this is a great system, and in our university ensures that we have meetings and um, other things scheduled during the working day and take into consideration time that... Uh, couples would need to take off to look after their children so it's a great step in the right direction. I've recently set up a women's group called Women's Connected which is going to be involved with discussing women's health issues around the world because unfortunately women's health issues are a real uh, problem that we have to talk about because there are so many things that are substandard around the world. So yes Women can have it all, but they need to be seriously able to juggle. And this is not going to be what every woman's want, going to want to do. Some women are going to want to be able to just give up work and look after their children. And we should definitely not undermine that option for them. But for those women that want to have a career and maybe travel and do other things and delay motherhood, um, we need childcare, we need to be able to offer some of them egg freezing if they feel this is suitable. And we need those women to seriously be able to juggle. 
And this is a great quote from Ju Faust, who's the president of Harvard University. I'm not the woman president of Harvard, I'm the president of Harvard. And it was from International Women's Day, there were some really great things that were on Facebook and other social media. And I just love this really relaxing picture. And it says, here's to strong women. May we know them, may we be them, and may we raise them. And hopefully all of you have now watched this video, This Girl Can. This is just looking at sport and the fact that men and women in the UK don't even do the same amount of sport. It's men that are doing most of the sports and boys. And we need girls and women to be encouraged to take up sporting activities. So I think we're heading in the right direction. I hope that um, I don't have to give this talk too many times in the next maybe 10, 20 years. I hope in 20 years' time we have no need to give a talk about can women succeed in a man's world? Thank you.